Hi. This is a Conversations with Creatives visual podcast for Opus. Over the next few months, we're discovering what it means to lead a creative life. For many of us, creativity doesn't stop when we put down our tools. It's a lifestyle built brick by brick around who we are. Everyone follows unique paths, produces unique work, and has their own routines and responsibilities. So what does this lifestyle look like? Day to day, how do we best reflect ourselves as artists? In the first of this current series, we'll be hearing from four Emily Carr alumni, Alison Chan, Kirk Gower, Michelle Chan, and Zandi Dandazette. They'll share their unique journeys, explaining why they embarked on a creative career, what they imagined their post-student lives would look like, and what the reality has been since they graduated. First up is Alison Chan, an interaction designer who pushes the limits of what can be considered design and what is considered art. Her immersive and interactive piece in the ECU 2020 grad exhibition caught the attention of the Moment Factory, and she was the recipient of their prestigious award. I'm Alison Chan, and I am a UX UI designer slash researcher. I am quite multidisciplinary, and I first began when I was a young girl. I loved doing art, visual art, painting, um, painting portraits specifically. And then in high school, I moved on to um, do some communication design um, and graphic design. And then in university, I, I thought I was going to go for visual arts and um, do painting. And then I found out about this thing called interaction design. And I was like, I want to challenge myself. And that's, that's a, I think that's a big part of my personality is I want to keep pushing what I can do. And so I learned about UI UX. Um, and then I started designing some apps for school projects. And then I was like, I want to bring it up a notch again and start programming um, using code and playing around with sensors and seeing what kind of art I can make with code. So going all the way back to where I first, uh, what I was first interested in, which was art. So it's really funny that it came full circle and I was able to mix all of these disciplines. So a creative life to me would be, well, creating um, things that you need to express, but with being genuine to yourself. And because it's creativity is very intimate, being genuine to yourself in that moment. If something is restricting you from being creative, not being able to have time for a creative life, trying your best to make time for that because um, I do feel like if you don't feed that fuel in you, it the other parts of yourself suffer. Right now in my nine to five job, it's quite hard to find time to be creative because I'm drained by the, the constant work. Uh, one way I try to do it is um, active, like making activities with my coworkers, not necessarily relating to the actual work at the job, but being like, so for example, when I first started, I had to introduce myself and give a little show and tell, but I decided to uh, dedicate half of that show and tell to do an activity with the, the people of my team instead. And so we were using a mural uh, board, so like the online whiteboard space with all the sticky notes and stuff. And I, I was like, now that I shared with you guys who who I am, I want to know about you, but um, in a fun way. Um, so I told them to make a creature out of the sticky notes, make something that represents you, and put your name next to it. My director was like, this is exactly what we needed. So thank you for facilitating that. It was and everyone had a lot of fun and then there were weird creatures that everyone made out of the sticky notes. When I was in university, my head was in the clouds and I was able to do anything I wanted. Like, 
I can make any project and there's no restrictions. Nobody's telling me you have to follow um, this business model or like you have to do this for our company. And now that I am in a team of people, even though I'm not able to be free and like very creative here, I'm learning all the tools and the structure that I need to to not, when I move on to, uh, maybe after this job, I can combine the freedom and creativity with like a structure and something that keeps me grounded. It's balancing me. So it's not it's not all bad like transitioning into a nine to five job. Like is there's still ways to take what you can learn and um, use it for what you need. I love to draw on my iPad and draw cartoons. I guess I try to make it a priority. It's like a part of my self love, like and a boundary for myself where I have to give myself time to make and create. I don't have a studio, I just do, I do it mostly I'm at my desk, just at home when my space is feeling uh, messy or like crowded with like cups or like trash or stuff, I can't. Um, it feels like that's on my mind before I can create. Just having my art on my wall too. So it reminds me like of the things that I've made already. And, and not to like um, brag about myself or anything, but I love, I love my art. So I love seeing <laughs> in front of me what I really want to do have freedom my creativity and I just really love making new installations and big um, pieces of art. Um, that would be really nice if I could be part of a place where they make like uh, interactive exhibits or like um, uh, like an interactive gallery or museum or something big that uh, gets a lot of people together and gets the having fun and uh, gets them feeling curious. So like, I want to be part of doing that stuff, big stuff. <laughs> Kurt Gower is a talented painter who works in the realm of queer identity and masculinity. His art, previously shortlisted for the Bombay Sapphire Artisan series, deals with queerness, romance, and vulnerability combining hyper-realism with graffiti abstraction. My name's Kurt Gower. Uh, I'm predominantly a figurative painter, focusing on masculinity, queer identity, and queer representation in painting. Um, a lot of my work deals with portraiture of real-life subjects and people close to me. Um, and then often I disrupt them using the very medium that I paint them in, which is oil paint. I like to sort of play around with the notions in the hierarchy of oil painting. Um, and also it's super seductive. There's something about the materiality of that particular product that I keep going back to and keep wanting to use. Um, when it comes to painting flesh, there's nothing like it. So it also sort of suits, you know, the subject matter that I'm painting as well. I was always pretty creative as a, as a child, so I was always grew up painting and drawing and, you know, a, a lot of the sort of early sort of beginnings of my creative journey would probably stem from my grandmother. Um, she was kind of uh, an interesting woman in terms of the way she saw the world and she was very modern and she didn't believe that, you know, you had to go into an uber professional industry to be successful. So she was really the driving force in pushing my creativity and, you know, pushing me to like question the world around me through art. So I think, you know, fundamentally she was the one who sort of started that practice. And then I, you know, amazing instructors and teachers along the way that also saw potential. Um, but I also just think, you know, on a personal level, it's always been the, the one thing in my life that I've had. So the idea of not having it kind of scares me. So I think that sort of pushes me now is that it's it's more of my identity than anything else in in my life so it would be weird not to sort of have this creative lifestyle to a certain degree i'm also a jack of all trades like the way that i split up my day is i'm a you know very corporate professional person by day and then by night i'm an art vampire so i kind of get the best of both worlds to a certain degree <laughs> i think a lot of people you know view creativity as like actually creating something but i think 
just thinking creatively has, you know, and my training at Emily Carr has sort of allowed me to approach, you know, very abstract ideas or, you know, abstract problem solving in terms of my corporate day job. It's funny, when I went to Emily Carr, I was very young. I was about, I started when I was 17 and I graduated with my degree when I was 21. So uh, I definitely have rose colored glasses in terms of what it meant to be an artist and what what that would look like for my life. And you know, I think in the initial years, I welcomed it where, you know, you have to be a starving artist or you have to, you know, really just eat, breathe art and that's all you can do. And I found that it wasn't a healthy sort of balance. Like I found myself, you know, really looking at that and, and deciding well, why does my life have to be this this hard if I want to be an artist? And then I realized, you know, the art that I create um, I don't want to have to compromise it. I don't want to paint for my living or paint for my food. So I realized early on that I also found, you know, the corporate world quite interesting and exciting. So I dedicated some time, well, probably 50% of my time focusing on that as well, which afforded me a certain lifestyle and also fed my art because, you know, art is expensive. And I think a lot of people don't understand that you know, we can make, you know, 12, 26 pieces in a year, but maybe only 20% of them sell. And that's not enough to, you know, live off of. So I've been very fortunate where, you know, I get enough from my sort of day job to feed my soul, but it also feeds my art, which in, in inherently excites me. So I don't have to compromise as much and, you know, and I, I can just pursue my art the way that I want and, you know, apply for the things that excite me. Fundamentally, at the end of the day, you have to do things for you. Like you can't, you can't create artwork for other people. You can't create it for the likes or the comments or you know the social media aspect as well. You really have to have this sort of internal driving force of you know, is this what I want to put into the world? Is it sincere? Is it is it compassionate? And that's the way sort of I approach my art now. Is like it has to it has to mean something to me before it can mean something else to someone else. I wake up at 6 a.m., I start my job at 6.30, and then I'm usually done around 3.34. Uh, it gives me ample time to, you know, cook and, you know, nourish myself, and then I literally paint until roughly about 10, 10.30 at night. And I do a minimum of probably five days of week, uh, five days a week uh, of art, because that's as many days as I do my job. So it has to be equal because at the end of the day, it is creative and it is exciting, but it is a job. And there's so many other aspects to this, this art world that we, we don't often talk about. Like I will also, you know, dedicate after I've created a body of work, you know, uh, a couple days of week where, you know, I focus on social media, I focus on writing, you know, grants and applications. And, um, and a lot of that I find probably the harder part of my art job. Um, because it doesn't come necessarily naturally. But again, I've been really lucky where I worked in a corporate setting where I understand how to write an application. I understand how to position my work to get what I want. So again, it all sort of feeds into each other. So the idea of just having one or the other doesn't interest me anymore. Like I, I like both my worlds and I like the sort of overlapping of them as well. I have a two bedroom apartment here in Vancouver and my second bedroom is my studio. So I'm usually working on about three pieces at once, whether it's priming, middle stage, start stage, or end. And then I also have my sort of more admin office space. You know, and you know, it works really well for me. I, I'm a very clean painter. Like I'm almost uh, surgical in my approach in terms of like setup and, and cleanup. So uh, having it in my house hasn't been an issue yet, but obviously sometimes when I paint bigger, I do need a little bit more space. But as of right now, this seems to be working. and. I also love that I can, you know, turn off my, my work day and then go straight into into my practice and allows myself the versatility of taking a break here and there and then also working into later hours if needed as well. The getting ready to do something is almost as important as, you know, physically putting the paint on the canvas. So I spend a lot of time making sure my surroundings are exactly the way that I like it so I can sort of hit the ground running because when I enter this space and I'm ready to paint, I don't want to have to think about cleaning up a mess or where this thing is. It's all very organized. Living a creative life doesn't have to be what anyone says it's going to be. It can be exactly how you want to structure it and manage it. I think, you know, there's a lot of stigma on, you know, having a day job that feeds your, your art career. Um, I don't believe in that. I think you can have multiple passions. I think you can have multiple interests and you can be successful in a lot of different areas, not only in the art world. You don't need to just do art to be successful in art. 
you can be someone in a corporate industry and be successful there and also have a very successful art career. So I think, you know, figure out what you want and what feeds you and how you want your lifestyle to, to look and feel and then find a solution to make that work. And, and that solution can be anything. It doesn't have to be, you know, one way or the other. It doesn't have to be, you know, what other people have done in the past. That's not realistic anymore. And I think, you know, I wish someone told me that when I was younger, that, you know, you can you can do both. You're, you're allowed to be interested in business and you're allowed to be interested in art. And, you know, they can work together. I, I feel like that's been my internal struggle for the last, like, 10 years is like, oh my God, I'm putting more energy into my professional or corporate life than my art. And then, you know, I feel inter internally guilty about it. And then I finally got into a place where I'm like, no, that's allowed. You're allowed to do that. You're allowed to have other interests. <laughs> Michelle Chan is a gifted UI UX designer who has a passion for participatory health design. Last year, her project High Low and the community sourcing that created it caught the attention of the awards jury, and she was the recipient of the ECUAA Community Engagement Award. My name is Michelle Chan. Um, I'm currently a service designer, um, but I guess in practice I'm kind of just like an interaction designer. I, I kind of started off my artistic endeavors at, at, at a really young age, like when I was a kid, and I really loved fashion design. I loved um, graphic design and from there I just kind of moved my way up and painted and did everything and now I'm here as a service designer it's it's crazy I don't know how I got here I think for me a creative life is just thinking with I think for me it's specifically like a design mindset I think for me it's very specific towards design I really like just doing things on my own I like creating things just making stuff on my own like if that means like a print that goes on my wall, I make it myself or I do something fun with it or like clothing, like I'm starting to um, learn how to like crochet and knit and that's kind of, I know those are small things, but that's kind of how I do my creative life. I love collecting stuff that's like funny and, and playful. I love art and little figurines. So when we're in school, we have like this impression that we're going to like come out of school and do whatever we want, have a job and, and, and just live our lives but I think something that's been tough for me is when we work we work nine to five we work Monday to Friday and it's then okay so you do that work and and um and that can be creative you know it really depends I think in service design right now it's definitely on the research side it's heavy on um on just findings and understanding like um that it might not be as you know, creative and making as you want. I think it's after hours that I really do what I want. So after work, I'll start either crocheting or I'll start making something like print making. I'm still like trying this anthem type thing right now. That's where I really do like my fun creative work that I really, really enjoy and that, you know, there's nothing, no strings attached. I can, you know, play it however I want. There's no limitation. Um, I think I think that's the reality for me right now. This is just work and then figure out, you know, eating and stuff. And then we, we have fun and, and make stuff. We have two rooms. <laughs> so uh, from right now, I'm just really working from home. So basically I sit at my desk when I work and then I also sit at my desk or on my bed to do things like, yeah, just creatively. I guess you can call my office a studio. It's just. It's just, yeah, it's just one room where I just do everything. <laughs> I think I can work anywhere. There are times where I, like, crochet in the car. <laughs> or I, like, you know, go to go somewhere else to do things. Or, like, I go to my friend's house. When I was in interaction design and I was, like, in school, it was really, really hard to find time to do anything that's not digital. Or I'm not writing or I'm not making something or doing research or making like a UX UI prototype or something. Aside from that, I really didn't have the time to like draw or paint or make crafts or anything. And that was a little sad. So I've been really taking my time to make maybe some websites that I wanted to just prototype and have fun with. Drawing, painting like birdhouses. <laughs> I think those are the things that I actually really, really enjoy. Like I just make, I like making prints and stickers and 
stuff that's just like simple and cute and stuff that I like collecting myself. I have like months where I'm like, okay, I'm only gonna make pom poms, <laughs> and then I make like like a bucket of pom poms that are like nice and colorful and beautiful, and then I stare at it for a bit, and then I'm like, okay, I'm gonna move on. I'm gonna make some like keychains now, <laughs> and then I'll like go really crazy on that for maybe like a month or two, and then I'll move on. Um, yeah, it's like maybe making some stickers and then uh, I think a big part of that is also like investing and buying stuff <laughs> for those types of, um, explorations, but like, it's so fun. Yeah. I think it's, it's okay. Especially now that I have a job, it's the thing that I really look forward to at the end of the day. It's the thing that like, I don't have to think too, too hard about, you know, I, I went to art school. I was like really into art as a kid. And I always feel like I had to like pick one thing to do. Like I do design and then my whole life is in design, but I realized that I can do a whole lot more than that. Like I can do interaction design and I can do design research for work. And then after hours I can make anything I want. I can be a graphic designer or I can be a crafter. Or I can just practice things and and not have to feel like pressured to just pick one route. Like, and I think that's, that's what I kind of learned in the last couple of months as I explore my first time as a person who's not like a student. I think what makes me the most happy right now is just doing like crafts and, and doing small things that don't seem like, you know, really like art, like professionally artistic. I think that's just part of the fun and, and that's how I live my creative life. Zandi Dandazet is an interdisciplinary and new media artist who is also heavily involved in curatorial work and artists' rights. Founder of the James Black Gallery, they have shown their work extensively both nationally and abroad and have just finished an installation for Pride. My name is Zandi Dandazet. I am... <laughs> an interdisciplinary new media installation artist and a cultural worker. I kind of look at space as my medium. So that means that can be 2D, 3D, 4D, um, kind of working with anything I get my hands on. I live where art studios are, there's a gallery, I run that. And then I also do my own art practice as well. So um, even just the, the space itself, we don't have a deposit on it, so kind of are allowed to do a little bit of whatever to it. So, you know, I paint walls however I want. Um, I built a room that's a cave in it uh, using chicken wire and plaster cloth. Um, so, yeah, I'd say I, I, I live in the arts for sure. <laughs> I went to school for animation in particular because it seemed like it was building skills upon you know, you learn how to do things with your hands, you know how to like draw, but how do you think about like movement, you know? Um, and so that, that was kind of the things that brought me to coming to Emily Carr and, and, and going to school for it. The space that this is, uh, is the James Black Gallery, but I, I also am the president of the Pacific Association of Artist Run Centers. So that's all the artist run centers in British Columbia right now. And so I do a lot of work around that. And um, that could mean anything from like, meetings around advocacy for the arts um, or, uh, you know, developing like collective goals. <laughs> um, and, and so there's a lot of emails and digital space that I, I handle right now. I'm also in the process of doing an installation in the Vancouver Art Gallery Plaza. And so there, there's also a performance that are gonna be a part of that. So I am writing contracts um, and getting all those things, all the nitty gritty set up. So I do a lot of computer work currently throughout the day. And then towards the evening is when I usually find time to really like focus on the drawing side of things um, and, and, and and more playful things. But sometimes I also, because I run my own like self-directed lifestyle, uh, every once in a while I'll throw everything out the window and get really like hyper fixated on an art piece or a project kind of out of the blue and and that's kind of all consuming it's all I can do during that time and so things can fall to the wayside while I'm <laughs> doing that 
I think that everything feeds into each other, right? It's all, it's all like a circle. Networking is like the capitalist, like, taking version of what community is, right? Like, when you're building community, you always want to be giving and, and, and receiving happens, but you don't give for the receiving end of it, right? And so I think healthy community building ends up with you being uplifted amongst uplifting other people. Even me doing an installation downtown and, and having a decent budget, I, I looked at, okay, I'm bad at documenting my art, but you know, this person has done a lot of things for me. Can I put some of that budget towards hiring them on this? Oh, you know what? Performance artists haven't really gotten support during COVID. Maybe I can have some performances, which then do this rather than doing it myself and put money into some of the performers that are queer in my community. You know, it's, it's, it, 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 it's a part of everything that I do. I live a very charmed and weird life. I think back to when I was a teenager and I would talk in very specific ways very goal-oriented ways. I was very determined where I look back and I'm like, whoa, that kid had gumption. Um, but I had all of these ideas in my head where I wanted to live like in an art collective, but I wanted to live, I wanted to run an art gallery, but I wanted to live in a Victorian home, but I wanted to live in the city, but I wanted, you know, but I wanted this, but I wanted that. And, and I also, you know, around that time had developed like this very core way of just like living within like a color scheme. All of those ideas, I, I didn't think that they would all be bundled into one, you know? And the, the week that I graduated Emily Carr was the week that I moved into this, this space, um, the James Black Gallery. And, and, you know, a few months before that, the first time I walked up the stairs of this place, not knowing everything that it was going to be, you know, um, I, I was like, I'm, I'm, I'm going to live here. I'm supposed to live here, you know, and, and now it's been seven years. I'm kind of in a place where I'm like, what now? What's next? And trying to come up with ideas of what my goals might be. Um, and, and it's very weird to sort of have that after spending so much of my youth with like very determined ideas of what I wanted out of reality. And it's like, I, I have gotten them. When I, when I look towards the future, there's a part of me that's very excited to not wake up directly into um, a public space. It's very hard to, to let go of this when it's still continuing because it's kind of golden handcuffs. I don't pay rent and I live in the center of like Vancouver, you know, it's like that's a joy and the studio spaces are affordable. That's rare. So I can, you know, offer that. I want to make sure that the space is sustainable before I move on. I want to like make sure that the community around it has another space to go afterwards and so that's kind of where I'm at I'm, I'm I'm consistently in a bit of a limbo on doing really rad things and then also uh being like okay w when when does the the time end so that I can plan for it I think something that comes up a lot for artists is that they feel that they have to compromise their values um, when they attempt to uh, add business practices to their their art practice, right? And and if you're if you're deeply involved in the arts uh, or in, in a creative lifestyle, and 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 you do want to have it outside of like maybe um, a hobby sort of way. Uh, you have to, you have to learn these sort of like mechanisms that are a part of our society, but you can find loopholes <laughs> and ways to like stay true to your own uh, value system and integrity while also doing that. Right. And I think that for myself, um, I feel like I've, I've really accomplished that in many ways. Um, some of it by, you know, uh, maybe luck or privilege, but also through like sheer hard work to be like, no, this is the way I want to do things. You'll save yourself a lot of exhaustion by actually learning, you know, put your receipts away. There you go. You got your receipts. Now, if, when you finally actually get serious about it, you'll have them, you know, like little things like that. Just have like a little folder, you know, you know, just, just make that website. Just 
sit down for 24 hours, make the website. It doesn't have to be perfect, but then you have one. You know, just like these little things that really do set you up for success later on that make life easier while you're navigating this sort of like creative lifestyle. I'd like to thank Alison, Kirk, Michelle, and Zandi for sharing their insight and experiences with us. Next month, we'll be discovering what a full-time creative life looks like with four professional artists who are a bit further along in their careers. I hope you'll join us. Thanks for listening. <laughs>